here with Patrick Seville, legendary lure maker, IGFA representative, IGFA lifetime member, uh, world record holder. Uh, Patrick, it's good to see you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing really, really well, and very good to see you, and see you're in good shape, my friend. Yep, so far so good. I could use a haircut, but aside from that, uh, you know, thank God we're doing all right. So I can use a bear cut. <laughs> That's right. I guess That's when right. we go to consignment, I'm gonna make a big clean, you know, cut everything, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Well, perfect. Well, hey, I just uh or thank you for joining us here. Um, you know, this is kind of a, a IGFA interview with you, Patrick Sabil, about uh, lure design and innovation. Um, and I first, you know, just wanted to kind of start off, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things here, uh, but I wanted to start off with kind of just, you know, give me a little bit of background about, about you. I mean, obviously you, you've been making lures for a long time. Some of the, some of the most innovative lures on the market for, for decades. Um, so tell us a little bit about, about where you are right now and, and, and what you're doing as far as, you know, your, your lure making. Sure. Yeah. My pleasure. I, um, Trying to make very short, a very long story. Uh, I designed my first lure when I was eight, so it was very, very closely connected for most of my life as being an angler, love fishing, and loving to create my own lures and um, obviously be able to share my creation with other people. So uh, I've been involved with a big lot of companies um, developing lures, but also rods and reels. I mean, real all kind of things, hooks with Gamakatsu. Uh, my very first. Um, uh, business acquaintance was to develop fishing rods for, for a big European company. Um, then I was working with Meps and Mr. Twister for whom I designed a, a number of lures over a period of I think 12 years or something like that. I really worked with a number of companies and then um, basically I was a, uh, a fishing guide also living in Africa. So I was a journalist writing articles, I wrote more than 800 articles for a number of magazines. I wrote seven books and I was living um, about two thirds of a year in Africa mainly, where I was guiding. I owned several fishing lodges there, including the uh, lodge in Gabisau, where I was uh, the captain for the Altecal, still to this date, IJFA Altecal World Record, who knows, 286 and a few ounces. So I guess, yeah. I guess <laughs> I shouldn't say lure maker. Lure maker was uh, was an understatement as far as your credentials, you know, and that's just <laughs> anything. It's very, uh, you know, it's very linked. I mean, Jack, you and I, we know each other for a number of years. I'm, I'm really glad every time I have the chance to, to see you and spend some time with you. It, it has been extremely connected, but I got to be honest, you know, living on a remote island in Africa uh, was a great part of my personal experience as an angler, as a guide, even uh, as a lure designer, actually. I designed some lures to fish for steelhead and brown trout and salmon, which I was designing and field testing in the islands of the Bijagos with a uh, 92 degree water just because the conditions were the same at the right time of the tide there was running water on rocks and it was very similar to the type of uh, condition for whom uh, those rules were, were ultimately uh, meant to be sold for you know, anglers fishing for the trout and stuff like that so i was connecting very much both worlds but after almost 18 years of having this kind of life it was really good but i was like I fed like a, a golden fish, you know, in a red, uh, in a bowl aquarium. Like I've, I've done everything I have to. You know, I guided for a lot of world records. I got myself a pretty nice number, like 35 or something world records and mm -hmm. all those things. And I was like, you know, I need some more things in my life. And I was designing law, as I say, for a long time and working with a number of companies. And I was like, I felt that was the time for me to make a big change and, and the law design based on the success some of my law already have with different companies was giving me the confidence that can be fully my new job my full-time new job being to invest into that and one big thing was as you my friend i was in love with the state of florida especially and i wanted to move from living those years in in uh, africa and moving in florida because i find my home here i really did found my home here and that was one of the motivation and then i create my my namesake brand Sibyl. And um, well, the company did pretty well for a number of years until I joined uh, the giant Pure Fishing. And several years ago, I was free to go by my own again. And uh, I came with this new company, a band of anglers. Yeah, that's awesome. And so what's, tell me about band of anglers. You know, where did that, where did that, first of all, the name come from? You know, it's, it's a unique, unique name. It's, uh, you know, but, you know, 
what uh, what's your goal? What's your vision with with this new new venture for you with uh, Band of Angles? Uh, it's uh, at the core of the core. The best question possible is the one you just asked, because uh, the Band of Angles is not just just the name of a company. I mean, I have nothing against many companies who put the name on themselves and they create and sell their product. That's all fine. For me, uh, really, what I do is my lifestyle. It's not just my my job or my paycheck. Uh, it's, in fact, the job or the paycheck is almost the smallest part of what it is. It's important. We all need to make an income and make a living. I have two four-year-old twins. I need to feed them. I need to pay for them and stuff like that. So of course it's important, but that's not the big motivation. It's to share my creation. It's super exciting to me to do that. So why a band of anglers? Because I believe there are many, many bands of anglers. When you go with your best buddy on your boat, you're a band of anglers, not just band of anglers, a band of anglers, because there are many out there. It's just one of the many, a band of anglers. And when you look at the logo, I don't know how well you, you can see the logo, but when you look at the logo, basically what you see is an image that shows myself, my son, and my daughter. So that's the heart of my band of anglers. My own band of anglers is myself and my two kids. That's the most important thing of all. That's cool. So you said earlier um, that you designed your first lure when you're eight years old, right? Yeah. Eight years old. So since that time, if you would, if you could, or do you have, are there, are there favorite lures? Are there ones that stick out in your mind that you're, you're more proud of than others or ones that um, have been more successful or, or ones that have caught more fish or, or any, any one that stick out more than others? Um, some, some did, uh, and for different reasons. And, and that's right. You, you, you asked me with a very open range of, of possibility and question. I, I bring a few of those bait from the, the civil time. Well, for example, that guy is named the Flat Chad, and especially dear to me because when I was working on my first set of lures for for the civil brand, uh, you know, I, I was my head was fully on what I have to create, create a company, go through all the paperwork, you know, the not fun part of the job and stuff like that, but which is needed. And literally, and I'm not kidding you, I was literally standing in my home, I was dressed, my luggage was ready, I was waiting for the taxi to pick me up. It was my home in France, Southern France in, in Nice, for those of you who know the place, waiting for the taxi to drive me to the airport. And suddenly, I mean, like a, a sparkle in my head, I was like, I forgot to develop a vibration bait. <laughs> I was like, how oh, okay. I mean, It was so obvious I need one in my first range of bait. I cannot believe it was in front of my nose and I totally missed it. And I was like, oh no, you know, but I knew exactly what I want. I knew because of course in somewhere in the back of my mind, I guess, you know, I put a number of things together, technical thing. I love knowing about techniques. I'm not speaking, I mean, I love techniques of fishing, but everything about techniques, you know, you put things together, how what, and why a lure work a certain way. I kind of knew that pretty well. And my thinking about the vibration bait was quite different from the typical thinking, which was to have a wide head and a narrow belly, which need a lot of pull, so a certain amount of speed, so then the lure can vibrate, but at slow speed, the lure don't vibrate. And I have that idea that I want to create turbulence, so the lure will be unstable even at slow retrieve. So I'm standing, I'm all dressed, my luggage is next to me. I'm waiting for the taxi to say it's you know, in front of the door. I took a piece of paper, I took a pen, and literally I didn't even sat. I just make that drawing what I have in my mind, what was making sense to my point of view, which was quite, quite different from all the other uh, vibration data of the time. I came with that design, I flew uh, to Asia, I arrived in the factory, I just had that handmade design, I put the dimension, we turned that into a 3D drawing, um, we cut um, into a plastic part, we cut the, the, the parts, I put that together, I put the weight where I was thinking that was right, and the lure worked right away. But you know the most funny thing of all? That was the lure that won back to back two big Elite Series tournament, bass tournaments in the US, and that launched my company. So that's incredible. That one lure, I, I did a sketch within one minute or so, realizing I forgot that lure, turned about a year or so later, to be the one lure that launched my company. So you see a lot of story for a tea bait. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. When, when was that? That was back in, um, I guess, 2003 or four, something like that. 2003 or four. Nice. Nice. <laughs> a flat, a flat shot, right? Yeah, that, that, uh, that was a flat shot. So uh, that's why a lot of his story with this guy. Um, I bring a few of my old civil baits. Uh, the stick shot was another of the baits that don't be yeah. well known. 
the small size mostly for the inshore anglers and the larger size for uh, um, you know striped bass anglers and stuff like that and and there were a number of jerk bait out there and there were a number of good lures but I felt I can do a better job and give better action but I need to find a way to 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 give a certain level of instability so the lure will work better and that's how I have the idea of of the power kill underneath and that fin kill cuts full of water create tiny turbulence it's very very tiny but just that little addition was giving life to the bait and that's actually the one bait that launched my brand in the state of florida in the state of florida a retailer um uh, from port charlotte came to a wholesaler show um i think it was in atlanta or somewhere like that from a big you know wholesaler and uh, <clears throat> he has with him uh, jay withers a good friend of ours uh, mm. was with him in the show <clears throat> and they saw that one bait that we have on the booth and he looked at that and said i think i can catch redfish with that and my sales person have only that one you have one bait of each that was it on, on the booth that's all you have at the time so jay uh came back at the end of the show and said really i i I'd like to try that bait and finally my sales guy said you know that's the only one i have right here so i give it to you but at the end of the show and then he gave it to him the next week they have a tournament and then bam he won the tournament on that one bait and not long later bam he won another tournament and then people start to talk about that crazy bait and, and within literally a few months we were in probably half of the shops of the entire state of florida thanks to that bait but most likely the one lure most people know and knew about um about the civil brand was the magic swimmer it was by far my, my my best thing bait i mean just to give you a number uh, when I was last at Pure Fishing, we reached already seven and a half million pieces of that lure sold. Which is, you know, in the lure business, you have many, many, many thousands of lure, and most of them have a very short lifespan. Um, many of them, some of them sell a few hundred, some a few thousand, and then the lure just go away. Um, but a few lures, and there's not that many, really sell by millions. Like the Super Spook, every Super Spook. Well, many people knew also the Magic Swimmer. And the story about that was, as an angler, as a guide, using a lot of lures, but also baits and stuff like that, you know, back 20, 25 years ago or so, I created that bait about that time, 25 years ago, so several years before Sibyl. I was just watching the bait fish, and I was watching the lures that were available. And indeed, there were a number of lures that were catching fish, but they didn't really mimic the swim action of a real bait fish. And my idea was, I want to design a lure that really swim like a real bait fish. And I, I did all the work to achieve that. There was no lure like that on the market at the time. But I did that just for me. I, I built that lure maybe for maybe seven or eight years, just a dozen or two every year, just for me and maybe a couple of friends, not even selling them, just giving them away. And then when I created Civil, it was making sense that I bring that bait. And that bait, once the flat chat start, started to make a buzz on the freshwater anglers, I mean the bass anglers really, and some people tried different of my baits. And uh, some guys like uh, Todd Fairclough, for example, uh, was who still won eight series and, and uh, a few, uh, the Canyon Hill also to name another one, started uh, to win tournaments, bass elite series tournament on Magic Swimmer and then the buzz was out. So that was, uh, you know, three very key baits. And I wanna just show that one very quickly. That one didn't sell much really. That was the, the popular buzz. But why is that, that very special to me? Very, very special. Well, it was because years ago, a friend of mine who was working with me at Pure Fishing at the time, came to visit me after a meeting, and I took him to Lake Okeechobee. He never fished bass in his life. He wanted to, but he lives in Europe. He caught pike and zander and a number of fish, but he never had a bass. And actually, um, I told him, be in the front of the boat uh, with, with the captain, and uh, we are very, I was very happy to let them fish on the front and have all the bites. And I told him, look, I'm just gonna concentrate on one bait and just try to cut to get one big bass. And indeed, I got one bite. For the entire day, I got one bite, and it turned to be a IJFA largemouth bass uh, world record by the length, and that was on that day. So I have a pretty good story on, on this day. <laughs> I, I remember that fish, man. That's uh, You guys came in and dropped off the application. I remember that. Yeah, Absolutely. that's right. No, so. that's, uh, well, that's pretty cool. I remember um, one of my personal favorites, I have used some of your stuff and um, the bonga minnow. I had a lot uh -huh. of good success with the bonga minnow too. That's a, that's a great, uh, that's a great lure. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, speaking to the offshore crowd, I mean, you, you do a lot of hard baits. I know you've done some soft baits too as well. Um, have you ever, did you ever have any 
inspiration in, or desire to kind of go into the like the skirted lure uh, realm, you know, like a trolling offshore marlin lure or anything like that. Did you did that ever? Did you ever go into that or, or not? So just just to give you an idea, um, I mean, I design probably uh, more than a couple of hundred baits uh, that end up to be on the market. So some um, aglia. Uh, spinners, for example, right now on the market for people who fish for trout or smallmouth bass, and I design them. I design all kinds of things. But the, the reality was that, um, first of all, I love the lure. The one I love the most are the lure for everything that's about casting and spinning. You know, right. that's what I love the most. But also, that's a wider market, and when you do things for a living, you have to put that uh, part of that. So for those couple of hundred lures that were already in the market. I probably created five or six hundred different type of lure, including some skirted lure. I actually have a couple of, of drawings that I may bring in my new company in Ben of Angers, in one of my brands that include this kind of bait. But the, the fact is when you invest, in a, and I don't like much to, to see too much things about business, but still there's a reality. When you go through all the work it takes, you know, the cost involved, making the molds, making the stock inventory, um, you, you need to make something that's that a re rationale that, that goes well together. And you reach so many more people when you go about lure casting and, and, and spinning um, outfit um, with lures, which also is my main passion. So uh, you, you may see sometimes some, some stuff um, that I design, which, which I bring into um, some decent, I think, innovation for this kind of lures. Gotcha. So, you know, it's no secret to a lot of people that know you, or for those that don't. I mean, you fished all over the world. I mean, you fished, you know, I think probably every continent except Antarctica. Maybe you've even been there. I don't know. Um, yeah, speak actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all seven continents. So, in your, uh, you know, this is probably going to be tough to do. But what, what's your favorite? What's your favorite fish? Your favorite place that you've been? Some place that you know, you'd like to go back to, or um, you know, not not saying that if you had one day to fish, where would you fish? But you know, what are some of the highlights you know that, that throughout your career, as far as fishing destinations and, and catches? Well, actually, the one of the key reason that I live in Florida is like because it's not the very best fishing spot in the world, but it's pretty good, and that there's a lot of variety, and I love variety. I mean, that's one of the things that makes me really really happy is to catch range a variety of fish you know like uh, in terms of fish species i think my la latest count i am at 782 different fish species nice. so that's one of the things i love so florida actually most people may not know but when you ask someone the question where in the world is the widest number of variety of different fish many people think oh maybe it's the policy in australia maybe it's in indonesia whatever well no actually it's the state of florida yeah. Florida, from the entire world, is the place where you have the most fish species that have been, been uh, scientifically counted. So, yeah. and yes, so so that's part of that 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 answer. Now, if I think about a very specific thing, like I loved fishing with big lures from the beach for big fish. Okay. About that, Gabon is my favorite place. Because Gabon. Gabon is the kind of place where I've been maybe five or six times, so not many many times, but not just once. But that's the kind of place when you fish from the beach, you typically don't have many bites. It's very often you have only three or four bites a day, but you really have a good chance to have a 90 pound Cubara snapper from the beach. You can have a 180 pound, true 80 pound tarpon from the beach. You can have a 52 pound Jack Revel. You can have a seven or eight foot long Barracuda from the beach. So, so when I'm more specific, I, I love some destination for something very specific, you know? I love to go in Panama to fish with my friend Olivier Charpentier, who, to my point of view, is really one of the very, very best captain when you, you want to be targeting big tubera snappers or big booster fish from a boat with lures in Panama. He, he, uh, you know, so I have the chance that I was able to travel a lot as a guide. I, 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 I guided in about 40 or 42 different countries. I was used, I was mainly based in Africa, but I was used to go for two weeks, you know, doing a deal with a, 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 with a fishing a lodge somewhere. And having a couple of dozen of my customers who follow me a bit where I, I where I was going, so I was one opportunity to go in many places. Another one was as I was writing for many uh, magazines 
on a regular basis, I was sent somewhere to, to go to write an article about a fishing location. So that, that's why, you know, um, I had the chance to be in many places, but on, on, a, on a daily basis, I choose to live in Florida because I find a lot of things I love. I'm a huge fan of snook. I love snook to death. I love bass to death. Where the one best place in the world where both snook and bass are, are there in good number and big size. Well, that's Florida. You know, there's very few places where you really can fish on the daytime a pond and have almost every single day the chance to possibly catch a 10 pound bass. I'm not saying catching one every day, but I'm saying in most ponds and lakes in the state of Florida, there's a decent chance you can have a bite of a 10 or a 12 pounder. Very few places in the world have offered that chance. I mean, here, even a tiny pond that's one or two acres may have a 12 pounder inside. And then I can go at night at the right place in the right tide, and maybe I can have a 42 inch snook, who knows? So yeah. that's why I'm so much in love with the state of Florida, really. You know, my all time favorite fish, that's probably a funny one for many people, but that's the gilted sea bream. And the gilted sea bream is basically a cousin of uh, the sheephead that we have here in Florida. But that fish, which we fish uh, in Europe, you know, some in southern England. France, Spain, Portugal, Mediterranean Sea, and Northern Africa, all the way down to Senegal. Uh, that's, to me, the most finicky fish. And I've been catching permit, I've been fishing bonefish, and I promise you, gilted sea bream. If you know how to catch gilted sea bream, bonefish and permit, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny game. It's, it's not that difficult. Catching uh, a sea bream on the lure and stuff like that, and I will say that to the, those of you who live where we have that the sheephead, the Atlantic sheephead we have here, I mean, target those guys on lure, on purpose, and you will see that's much more difficult than to put them on the hook than to put almost any other fish you have around here, and uh, and you can, I, I I do, but it's a very specific way to target them. Um, they are not active everywhere. I mean. And that's part of what I love. And the Gitlet Sea Bream is extremely finicky. It's fantastic fighter. It's a beautiful fish. So still in my heart, it's the one that owns the number awesome. one place. <laughs> so do you do you ever use bait? <laughs> Very rarely. I, I'm not saying no. First, I'm not against the bait. Right. Um, I just, to me, the, the ultimate expression of fishing is and, and sport fishing is fishing with a lure. Okay. Because when you, you take a live bait, and I'm not saying that to say it's wrong or it's bad. I, I just want to share with people my own point of view. It's not, uh, I'm not trying to put value and say uh, Lua and Lua are better. But it does, it's not about that at all. But when you take a live mullet or live shrimp or dead, whatever, and you put a hook and you put it in the water, you simply wait for a fish to feed on something it's used to eat. When I play with a lure, that's a piece of plastic, soft plastic, that's a piece of lead, that's a piece of our plastic or wood. Now that's where I need to trick the fish to buy that. That's sure. where my value of an angler come. And I rather have one fish on the lure than five on live bait. But that's my personal yeah. feeling and point of view. With using an artificial bait, a lure or something like that, or a fly or whatever it is, I mean, you're, you're putting yourself at somewhat of a disadvantage. And you're making it more challenging. And yeah, like you said, you have to trick the fish to uh, to get it to bite from what it's used to eating. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, I've seen that in some of your lures. And I think that, uh, you know, that, that drive to create a, a product and a lure that is uh, as lifelike and as, as realistic and has the, the same characteristics as a live bait is, and I would assume, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would assume that's, that's what is kind of giving you some inspiration and motivation uh, throughout your career as far as designing lures and everything, as far as uh, oh, growing. Yeah. You're spot on. You're perfectly right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, there's the, and there's the play with the lure itself. And I explain what I mean by the play. All of us, every single of us, time to time, so we're on a day where fishing is super tough and you don't get a bite for the entire day. I still am happy because that all day I was playing with lures, sure. casting the lure with a great accuracy, making sure the lure hit the water with the most minimum impact to not afraid the fish if they are spooky around that. 
uh, the distance where sometimes you have to make everything perfect in your movement to optimize the distance you can reach because say you're from a beach and there are some striped bass or something and you're just 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 at the limit to reach them so you have to make to take sometimes a minute or two or more if needed just to wait to be exactly in the perfect movement and everything because maybe on that one cast you maybe will be able to catch that one fish of the day and maybe that's going to be a trophy maybe even more an ijf record who knows so i play with the lure i play in the way i work them so just that makes me happy i play with a twitch bait that's one of the type of bait i love the most because i love twitching and i love to play because i know depend on one rod to the next one i have more of a, a tip action one have more of a um you call that more progressive action i'm not going to twitch in the same way the the way the twitch bait will react will not be the same i love to play with that so right. i can i'm not kidding you guys i i can spend a full day casting a lure not having a fish i mean I, I do everything i can to catch fish don't get me wrong but even if it doesn't happen i'm super happy i work my top quarter bait to make all kind of action sometimes i want it to be very regular sometimes i want it to be more erratic just that i'm super happy with that i play with them you know when when you're a kid, and I think as anglers, honestly, I always think we're always kids, but adults, I'm 51, so I'm 51 years old kid, and all those things here are my toys. Um, and they can help me to connect with the fish, which are some of the most beautiful animals on the planet. You know, I, I am deeply in love with fish themselves. So that's why when I play with the lure, oh man, I, I have so much blast with that. And in my relationship with the fish, it matters too, because more likely, the, the potential damage you can do to, to a fish to arm a fish with a lure potentially is less than with a live or dead bait because live or dead bait are more easily swallow deep and i mean every animal including humans are the same uh, if you have a piece of steel that pierces into your stomach there's good chances you're not, not gonna make it you know right so that's one one thing with live bait um i mean i do it again i fish sometimes i, I have some but really, just once in a while. Um, yeah. And I don't force myself on either. If I feel tonight I want to go with a live bait, I don't put myself a limit and say, oh, no, I'm not going to use a live bait because I designed lure. No, if I want to, I do it. Just I like right. more lure. <laughs> so let's let's switch gears here for a second. So sure. you, obviously when we started this year, you're an IGFA representative, have been for some time. You've caught IGFA world records. You've guided people to IGFA world records. Uh, you're an IGFA lifetime member. When did you first hear of IGFA? And what was your introduction, if you can remember? Uh, when, when did you first hear about it? So that's quite interesting, I think. Um, the, for a long, long time, the very most famous fishing magazine in France was, and is still named to this day, um, La Pêche et les Poissons. So fishing and fishes, if you like, quick translation. So I, that's where, in the mid 70s, uh, my, my parents took me my uh, subscription from uh, the July 1976 issue. <laughs> July 1976 issue, I remember that to this day. And that is in that magazine that I first saw a few times naming the IJFA. Um, one, one of those I remember well was there was a selfish tournament in Senegal and the editor-in-chief, uh, Daniel Mori, from that magazine went there and uh, uh, there were some of the famous French anglers who joined that tournament and other people. And one of the people who joined was Pierre Klosterman. And Pierre Klosterman, for those who don't know, was the, the French ace during World War II. I mean, he was an 18 years old young man, Frenchman who lived in Los Angeles at the time. With his own money, he flew to Florida. He paid some uh, pilots to teach him how to, he was already a pilot, he was from a wealthy family. Uh, but, you know, many wealthy people maybe who last just in Los Angeles, far away from the European war at the time, you know. But he came here, he paid uh, some pilot to teach him how to plane, how to maneuver a plane for fights. And then he took a boat to England to join the Free French. And he told me years later, he told me that when he left in his luggage, there was like three shirts, two pants, some underwear, one fly fishing rod, one spinning rod, and some lures and some flies. I mean, that tells you who he was. So when I heard about him, I, I just know I see him sometime in the news, you know, because he was also a politician at some point and stuff like that. Um, and then I have the chance to, to, to meet him a few years later 
uh, and th there was a big French fishing show. Like here, we have some you know fishing show in the U.S. Not I'm not talking of a TV show. I'm talking a show where you have you know booth and brands yeah. are here and you can go. And there was uh, the he founded the BGFCF, which is the Big Game Fishing Club of France. Yeah, and uh, they had a booth. And I stopped by and I turned to know one gentleman who was a member. And that's where I met, um, met Pierre Kosterman. And very, very quickly uh, after meeting uh, Pierre, Pierre um, told me one day that um, told me something extremely positive about myself. So I don't want to brag. I'm not going to share, but I was <laughs> extremely positive about myself. And I was amazed to hear such big personality saying that to me. And the he told me, he said, you know, you should, uh, you should be a member of the IJFA because really if there's in the entire world one uh, non-lucrative organization that do the best for the resource, for the fishermen themselves and to put the rules together, it is the IJFA. So I follow his recommendation and I, I signed to be a, a member. And then after a few years and, you know, and I was guiding more and more and I was starting to make, to make a good name for myself as a, as a guide, um, one day he say, you know, Patrick, um, we had a, di a dinner together. I say, you know, Patrick, I, um, I think you will be a perfect person to be a representative for the IJFA. So if you're interested to do so, I will be like your godfather to, to sign upon you and, and make my own report about yourself and why it should be beneficial to the IJFA for you to become a, an IJFA rep. So I was very honored that, um, Pierre Klosterman uh was was there i mean i think pierre was the first um i try to remember the name but yeah for a number of years he was the first and the only for a number of years to have a very honorary uh, title at the ijfa i don't recall what was that title now to be honest that's years ago he passed ambassador away. or something like that right oh that was trusty emeritus it was the first emeritus, okay. trusty emeritus yeah the first ever created by the ijfa that was for him He's He's the uh, he's got the record for Atlantic blue marlin on four pound test, I believe, and it's an right. incredible. It's like five hundred pounds or something like that. I can't. I don't have it in front of me, but it was like, uh, yeah, inclusive. And I, I believe his son uh, still. Um, I think it's his son or one of his. It was a Klusterman who submitted a uh, a world record this past year uh, fishing out of was it Senegal, Morocco, fishing out of Morocco um white marlin on two pound i believe two pound test crazy but anyway well, that's, that's a great story and that's that's cool and i have plenty of real of those one one with jack one with his son basically in morocco he was a, a pilot for our friends and we came into trouble i will pass that story but i was a good one <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent man so what's well, you know as we're kind of we're, we're winding down here what's what's coming out what's new you know i know you're you're always working. You're always thinking. Always, uh, you know, looking ahead. So, uh, anything we can we can uh, expect from you here in the near future? Anything? And and that's what I did. I bring a selection of my new baits here on the table. I'm gonna show them to you and uh, to introduce uh, to to my fellow mem co members at the IJFA. Um, again, when I design low, I'm not just trying to say, hey, I need a crankbait and just make one crankbait like there are several dozen on the market. I really to find ways that really give a plus because first of all when i design every single of my bait first of all it's a little bit selfish probably but first of all i want to design them so they can work the best for me they can help me to do things that overlook can or do things overlook do but better so for example before going in detail for example uh, one of the brands i came with now is called ocean Ball. so my company is called a band of anglers but it's not the brand itself and i decided to create uh, several different brands so each of them have more of a specific focus for example ocean born is more about well the name says that right ocean born is more of a salt water and generally speaking big fish lures more strong than typical than typically over lures are made and stuff like that so if you want to go peacock bass or if you want to go well cut fish in europe they also make sense because they are stronger than the typical baits and stuff like that so but most of the time people will look for big and strong fish go in salt water so, for example, some of the things you can see, I hope, here underneath are those ribs underneath the belly. And in fact, what I did here was to, to bring the same innovation that you can find on golf balls. You know, they have those little nibbles, all those many holes around the golf ball, which help when, when you, you put 
you know, on the ball and the ball flies in the air, it helps to create a lot of micro turbulence to lower the, the, the friction against the air, which, which helps for longer distance and more accuracy. So it's exactly the same thing here, except that the lure is not made to squeeze in the air. When the lure spins in the air, you lose a lot of energy, so you lose distance in accuracy. When a uh -huh. ball which is not attached by line and which is round, it's different. So coming with those reefs basically helped me with the same exact lure, same exact design, weight, and everything, helped me to gain anywhere between 5 and 10% longer cast. So that means for the angler, doing exactly the same, exactly the same cast, the same rod, same reel, same line, same movement, if you have another lure of the same length and same weight who don't have that, well, for the same amount of energy you spend to make a cast, this guy goes 5, 5 to 10% longer. So you reach more fish, and at the end of the day, you cover more water, and typically, you cover more water, you have more results. So that's one of those kind of innovation. And you can find that on a number of, of, uh, of, of my lures in, in that range. Then there are some wings. So this guy, by the way, is called the flying pencil. But the fish I'm showing you right now are found on several lures. The wings also have an angle. So the wings really help to stabilize the lure in the water. And in some cases, for example, that lure comes in a floating version and a sinking, which casts which cast better and longer than a floating but also SLD, which means super long distance. When you use the SLD, you make a long cast, but it's very heavy. So typically, if the lure was a normal pencil bait with no wings, it's so heavy, the SLD, I think, is two and a half pounds. When floating, two pounds. So you see the difference is huge. So without the wings, that lure will fish, well, underneath the water, underneath the top, when in fact, most of the time, you want to use a pencil on the top. So here, with the wings, it's like a surfboard, it gives more leverage on the water, so now I can have a lure that's quite heavy, which is better for longer cast, and especially when it's windy. You know, when it's windy and you have a floating lure, and, and the wind comes in your face, and you want to cast a floating lure, really the lure don't go very far away, it may go sideways, land on the side. So right. having a lure very heavy, in fact, that lure charged with more energy into it, and it pierces the winds much better. You still make good cast against the wind, with a SLD lure. So that's why I was in need of the wings and they help also to have stream action. So that guy, for example, is uh, the cool. flying pencil. You find the same thing on the flying popper. So you have the same big reefs here. We have several sizes. That's the 170 right. that just now we have two smaller size here. We have also those wings. And for example, not only that lure cast and pop, most people, I mean, every popper does pop, right? It's normal. But then when you take that SLD, and you just have a steady retrieve, it actually swim like a swim plug. Yeah. Like literally, if you think about a magic swimmer action, you are pretty much the same, except that a one piece body, not a jointed body. You have the right. same action as a magic swimmer, but on a popper. And more than that, it's so heavy, you can let it peak and you can jig it. I've been catching anchor jacks in 200 feet of water, close to the bottom with a popper, because I was jigging. And the wings helps because when it glides, in, instead of diving straight, he dives sideways and he glides in the water like a squid or a bait fish fling. And then when you swim, even from the bottom, you come up swimming like that and you bring it back to the top and then it pops. So you see that's the kind of approach I have, not just to come with one more popper. No, that's a popper that can cast much longer than others. That's a popper that can swim. And that's, at least in the SLD model, a popper you can also jig. Now, <laughs> that's crazy. Awesome. in the theory, you see the flying darter. Uh, darter, darter bait are lures that don't have a bill actually. So the, the flying darter have no bill, but that one again is made and tuned to make long cast, much longer than the typical darter that you have. It's typically the kind of bait people use in the Northeast for striped bass, and some people use the darter at night, especially for tarpon and snook in Florida. It's not very, very well known, but the darter bait as, as a type of bait is really good for tarpon and for snook. And mine have the big advantage that it casts much longer and have a great action. And again, the big part of that is the ribs underneath the belly and the little wings on the side. Still, uh, for mostly for people who fish from the shore, I have the flying plug. It's the same thing. There's a number of plugs. The plugs, swimming plugs, are these kind of plugs that have a bit that's built in from the body itself. It's not really a bill like a minnows. Um, and there's a few dozens on the market. Actually, that shape came about 100 years ago. The first time one was designed is about 100 years ago. So uh, people have been using that. And again, that's the kind of bait many people use in the Northeast for striped bass. And some people know that here in Florida, 
That's a great bait. And many other places in the world, if I go back to Africa like Gabon, that's the kind of bait I will bring with me for Cuba, snapper and stuff like that. So it swim even at slow speed and it holds very well in the breakers. That's a big advantage. But again, thanks to the wings and the ribs, this one allows for longer cast and more stability in the cast and it's an enhanced better swimming action. And <laughs> yeah, now as a minnow, there's the white back minnow. So the white back minnow don't have the wings and I did the prototype. You know, when I do prototype, uh, very often I try different options and I go in the direction that gives me the best results. So I tried the wings on this guy, but in that guy, in fact, the wings were not helping on the swim action because it was stabilizing too much the lure because it's a bill, you know. But if you want to see a big innovation, look at the bill. Typically, bill are made of just one piece of steel or plastic or a few other components, but they are relatively weak to a certain point. Of course, the steel, the metal ones are stronger than the plastic one, but to a certain point. But when you make them thicker, the swim action is not the best. So what I, I did, what I came with, is a design where, in fact, I have that one bill that has two anchorage points, one here, one there. And thanks to that, the bill is actually very thin, very, very thin. So the lure have the best swim action possible, but because even if it all fits around or into your boat when you land to a carbia, um, it's a very, very strong bill. So it have the best action you can dream of for Mino, and it's very strong, very long lasting. Um, how long, how deep does that dive? Uh, this one depends the speed, of course, and depend. But uh, let me say something crazy. So, how deep does it dive? If you s retrieve it extremely slow, and if you remove the tail, the treble hook tail from the tail, you can have that bait working on the top as a wake bait, and just the tail goes out of the water and make a wake. But you have to remove the treble hook from the tail, and you go super slow. It's called the white bag minnow. If you keep the two treble hook, typically at the normal slow to very fast speed range, it's roughly between two and five feet. Now, what okay. is great to show you, and, and I'm not kidding you, Jack, and nobody who's watching that video now, this very bill, in fact, allow me, allow that lure to be extremely stable. We've been throwing this little guy at 26 knots. 26 knots. 26 knots, and that's because both of that super thin but super strong bill and uh, the, the ribs underneath the belly, because you know when a minnow swim like that, you have a lot of water displacement, and in fact, the, the, the pressure of the water on the belly tend to bring a lure to twist and turn sideways and, and turn and, and jump in the air, and that's why most minnow at once, I mean bill lure, at once given speed they go and jump out of the air, you know? Well, the ribs underneath allow for a very fluent, very easy movement of the water. So when the lure moves sideways, even at super fast speed, the water flows very well. So you don't have that pressure that a conventional minnow have. That's part of why. And that bill, 26 knots. So you can hold That's incredible. super slow at two knots if you want for tarpoon at night and stuff like that. And you can go all the way to 26 knots. And I'm not kidding you. Anybody can try and you will see by yourself. I'm not kidding you. Two to 12, or 0 0.5 to 26 knots, the white back minnow. It's, it's an incredible lure that you can troll and you can cast and retrieve. I mean, if you target, it's a six inch long, there's a 350 pound straight full wire, there's a 350 pound steel swivel, like the other lure I, I show you, I didn't went into the detail, but they have the same kind of structure. So you can rely on that. If you're targeting your next trophy fish or world record fish, you know those lures are made, are built super strong but they have also great action very very good action and i put my word and my name on it so um just to finish with that brand quickly so we saw a bit earlier that flying pencil i want to show you a smaller one so oh, yeah. that's what the, the color is not the final color but it doesn't matter the, the point is that what i want to highlight when i show this guy this guy is four inch and a quarter four inch and a quarter and that's the, the, the tuna rocket model. So it's a flying pencil, but the tuna rocket model, that weighs 70 grams, which means two and a half ounces. So now you have a very teeny pencil bait. And you know, for those of you who fish the blue water, you know, sometimes tuna only want to feed on very teeny prey. And the yeah. conventional bigger lure don't do the job. And when you go in a smaller lure, typically they're too light. You cannot cast them very well. And the hook is not strong enough. Here, I have both a lure that's two and a half ounces. So you can use 80 pound braid and make good cast and you have a tuna hook in the tail, and you have a swivel also in the tail. So that's the kind of approach I have. So 
every lure I try to see if I can use them in different condition and I have the tunings that are made for that. And to finish on that very brand, Oceanborn, I want to show one of my two um, bucktails. That one, that one is called the flying bucktail. Uh, so sorry, the swimming bucktail and the other one is the bouncing bucktail. So bucktail are some of the most efficient lure. And uh, back years ago, I was thinking bucktail were only working when the fish are stupid and eat anything, but I was wrong. Really, I've learned over the years that bucktail are fantastic lure for the one who knows how to use them. Now, quite often the problem is, for the limitation more than a problem, a bucktail is typically a piece of lead, one hook, and you have some feather or some piece of you know, bucktail, basically, or plastic material. So sometimes you want to make a very long cast, but you don't want to fish too deep, because maybe if you fish too deep, maybe it's snaggy, you're going to lose your lure. Well, I came again here with ribs underneath the belly, with wings on the side, you can see the wings, I think, pretty well here. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have a full range from three quarter ounce to three and a half ounce on that guy. And the bouncing one, the one for the bottom goes to five ounce, I think. Well, thanks to the wings, those guys deflect more. So if you eat against a rock, if you fish at night for striped bass, for snook, for redfish, whatever, and you have a jetty and you have rocks, well, you're less likely to snag this guy thanks to the wings. The wings deflect more, so the hook is much less in contact with uh, the rocks. And then when you land them on the floor, the wings keep always the hook up, always, 100% of the time. So that also less snag. And then the wings give action. When you give the right twitch, basically, that lure makes looping in the water. So without moving a lot, lure stay almost on the same spot and make a looping, which is very visual for the predator. We have a very strong hook, which is a shape I invented when I was 16 years old, which optimizes the strength of your hook because the pull point is here. You see? So now a regular hook shape, you know, the hook point, the pull point will be there. That's why the hook tends to open. But here, the lip of the fish, which is what I show with my finger here, is really where you have the most pulling point. So it's less likely to open. And when you have a leaping fish, like a tarpon or a bass or a snook, who jump and shake the head, the leap is here. So it's about twice the distance from a regular shape hook, a J hook, where the leap will be somewhere here. So the fact there's more distance means less fish loss when they shake the head. So it's all that kind of, of things I, I do and, and I have approached to. Now, the next brand I'd like to, to show and share with you, it's this one that's called Engage. For the moment, I have those two models which actually have the same shape, the twitch head and the twitcher. The twitch head is an actu actually a twitch bait so this guy is um, basically uh, uh, three and a half inch long. And when I design it, my goal, because I have the stick shot with Seville and the action is great. My goal was to make a lure for the same length that will make longer cast than a stick shot. So that's what it does. That's a twitch bait that you can use on the top water, make uh, working the dog, you can twitch it, you can jerk it, but it makes longer cast. And that's the way I designed the body where the weight are, are positioned and that have a good strong hook. Now, the twitcher, same body, but that's a soft body with a 300 pound wire inside. So now this guy, you can cast against uh, pilings and rocks where you know fish like snook are, because when you cast an arm lure against rocks, typically the winner is not the lure, but the rock and the lure break, you know? So that's why I made the twitcher with a 300 pound full wire, very strong hooks, um, and there's all this way. So you can add and remove a, uh, a rattle, and that's why it makes the most sound is when the rattle have that position. So that was also following years of using baits like the stick shard and, and understanding what can I do to do more, more things with, with such bait. And to finish, because I have seven brands, so I didn't want to go for a full thing, but I was like, okay, I will keep that one for the, the end because it's a specially interesting one. Years ago, reading a, a magazine about science, I read about the team who developed a, a plastic not at all for fishing, but that was a, a plastic material that was extremely long lasting. You can pull a lot on that, resist pretty well uh, to puncture and cuts. And that was nature uh, friendly. That means if that material ended up to be lost in, in the nature, there was no chemical when plastic will break down, there was no chemical that will hurt uh, any, anything um, you know, for, for the nature from a fish or whatever. So I reached that company, and I told them I was really interested by their product for fishing lure. And they were quite surprised because they were making high-end mattresses. I mean, $5,000 mattresses for bed. So that was definitely not at all <laughs> dedicated for fishing. 
and, and I work with that company and I got the, the sample I have to make mold because it's not an easy plastic to, it's not plastic you just can pour like the regular piece of plastic in your microwave. You can't, you, you need to have 200 ton or more power, injection power, so you need a real mold. But then that's a long lasting, so there are several long lasting plastic, you know, people know and respect brands like Zeman who was really a pioneer to bring some type of long lasting soft plastic. They are very good product. Mine is a bit different, the same overall family, but a bit different. And it allows, for example, for very sharp cuts and holes, which allow, for example, and we will see that even better here if I take a, so when I say it's strong, it's really strong. Uh, one of our guys got, I think, 142 large mouth bass on the same soft plastic. So that really lasts. And about, and a part of why I have my passion, I know when I speak of those things, I can speak for hours. I don't look at the clock. I'm terrible on that. I know. But if you look closely, that material allows me to make holes and slots in different locations. So when you want to rig it, that, that lure name is the dart speed. That's our best seller right now. That's a soft plastic body and a blade. And you can use in so many ways. So when you want to rig it, look, it's very easy. I simply use my, <laughs> got some call here. I simply use my, uh, my hook and I go for a hole that's already existing in the body. Just turn and now I take the eye of the hook and there's already a hole underneath. I simply have to position and that's it. So you see, it really takes one second to unrig and just a few seconds to rig. But thanks to that, it's not just the easiness of rigging that I want to highlight. It's because of that that the lure lasts much longer also, because you already have the holes in the plastic. You, most of the time, you don't need to puncture the plastic with the hook, so you don't create a weak point. You position the hook in the right place. And that lure actually have been incredible, and, and I'm, I really mean it when I say incredible. In terms of results, I have uh, four different sizes for the moment. That has been a lure that since uh, a year and a half ago, when I started to have good number to fish with between me and my dozen of friends, we hook about 800, 800 tarpoon on that bait. Not one, not the same bait, but that model. It's incredible. Wow. Tarpoon are incredibly in love with this lure. That's, that that's been awesome. That's a great lure. That's really nuts. And that's because when the blade works, the blade has its own flash and create turbulence, but I have a patent in the way the blade is attached to the body and the, the energy uh, that, <clears throat> that is created by the spinning of the blade translate into the tail and the entire body have a very tight vibration. And in fact, the underwater signal, because remember most fish, they predator fish, most of them, they find and they feel a prey by feeding the underwater signals. They, right. they use their eyes only really to adjust for the bite, but right. they can feel that behind them, there's a prey or lure, maybe, you know, 25 feet behind them. It's not because they see it, it's because they feel it with their lateral line. And I really believe, I'm very convinced, I'm very sure, in fact, that the amount of vibration created all over that bait helps for that, that create a really vibration that, I mean, everything, I'm catching bass, I'm catching, we have already big bass, 13, 14 pound bass that have been cooked on that. Um, bluefin tuna, when bluefin tuna are feeding on very thin prey, you those by the, by the head, you, you put a three, four feet long leader, two ounce weight, you can cast, and when the, the tuna are on very tiny prey, that works incredibly well. I mean, really, the dart spin uh, fits so many, so many different situations, fresh and salt water. That's crazy. Um, three more bait to finish that. And by the way, I'm working on a tiny baby, but that's for next year. So that's a little, a little surprise for the, the friends, the RDI cast, RDI GFA, sorry. It's not out there. You're going to have to wait one year, but I never showed to anybody. That was my little kind of gift tonight to show, to show with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, my, my new approach of a swim bait is this guy that's called the Dead Alive Swimmer. So we spoke earlier about the Magic Swimmer, my number one thing bait at Seville. Well, I came with a swim bait, but I didn't want just to be a swim bait. I want to do much more than that. So if you have the name, the name is the Dead Alive Swimmer, Dead Alive. Well, the Dead Alive Swimmer have a very good swim action. Okay, cool. There's others. Now, that one is really made to mimic a dying bait fish. So when you use the one with the weighted hook, so basically when you cast and retrieve, you have that swim action. When you twitch and you make pause, it dives. And when it lands on the floor, it always lands like that because the material is buoyant. And with the joint and the tail, if you look at the tail, I didn't make a plain tail. No, I made a tail that mimics a tail that have been damaged. You know, when a bait fish was beaten by a predator and escaped, most of the time you can see the fin are in a very poor shape. That's what it is. So every time I give even a very teeny twitch in, in the rope tip, you have that teeny tail that have just a teeny bit of movement. 
And if you use the same bait, but with the not weighted hook, now it floats back. So you swim it, you twitch it, and when you pause it, it floats back like that, which is exactly the position of a dead or dying bait fish on the top. It's an incredible bait, I, I promise awesome. you. It is. That curly mean have a curly tail, you know, with all the great action of a curly tail. And we have that guy, when we use it with a weightless hook, it makes a wake on the top. And you're it's crazy. So you have a curly tail that works on the top, and the tail makes a weight on the top to a super slow retrieve. And you have the weighted one that you use basically as a, uh, as a swim bait. And not only the tail work, but the body work all the time. This guy right here, it's called the sand eel. So that does have the shape of yeah. a sand eel. And you have that back cut on purpose. So you see the, rule, the, loop, the hook goes far away from the, the back. It's on purpose. Because when you set the hook and the fish is hooked right here, you have no more leverage of the soft plastic and much less risk that the fish will keep chewing. So if you have, say, a, a blue fish or barracuda, you know, some fish that are really sharp teeth, well, you can catch much more fish with the same bait just because the fish can chew on the hook itself like that. And then to finish, this little guy that's called the nat shrimp, natural, natural, nat shrimp. So, it comes in a floating, which have no hook. You just hook the way you want, or the sinking model. The body is the same, so the sinking already have a weight, but the way where the hook goes, the way it's attached. Oh, that's the way smart, yeah, that's cool. When you dive, it makes a, a swirl, and you have the legs. I don't know if you can see well, but oh, yeah. that yeah, yeah. have a lot of like, like motion. So on the drop, and then every time you twitch it, the tail bends back to the point with the right speed and cadence, you bring it to the top, and now it flees like that, literally the tail out of the water and the tail keep eating the water and makes pops, 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 like a shrimp that want to jump out of the water. It's incredible, it's so fun. So I'm sorry guys, but you know, it's my passion. I'm not here to sell you the stuff. I'm here to share with you what I designed. And that's why I make that selection. It's only about a third of my new line of lures, in fact. <laughs> Man, well, that's awesome. Well, where can people, where can people, so you've got band of, a band of anglers, uh, you've got Ocean Born, uh, what are the other the other brands people can can find these these products that you're making? Yeah, so we have Hyperelastics. Hyperelastics. We okay. have yeah, uh, we have Spooltech. For those who know, I again invented uh, that brand. I love that that patent. We pushed it, and I developed now new models for that. So you can find with a, a range of different uh, retailers, you know, uh, who are carrying more and more our, our product. And especially for you guys who have a very Special offer today. If you go on our website, which is www.abandofanglers.com, so I repeat, www.abandofanglers.com, and you type the code uh, IJFA25, you as an IJFA member, we have uh, one limited time only, you will have a 25% off of your order. So it's a way to, to share with you and to hopefully help you to go through those complex times we are all facing right now with that pandemic and i'm very sorry for the people who cannot go enjoy fishing but at least i'm i really hope you can enjoy seeing people like you and i being doing videos and helping them to make the the long days not too much boring at home that's right well, well we appreciate the uh, the offer very much man and and uh, i'm sure our members will as well and you know for the people that can't get out fishing i mean what better time to, to stock up the tackle box and get ready for when you can so yeah, uh, really, sure. Patrick, again, man, thank you. Oh, thank you, so thank much. you for spending all this time with us, man, and, and giving us all this knowledge. It's, uh, I'm sure we could probably talk for a couple hours more, but uh, yeah, we, you know, we'll do it again. How about that? Uh, I would love to do it again for sure. You know, do fashion. it again in person cool. next time. Huh? We'll do it again in person. And maybe have a drink or something. Yeah, yeah. come fishing. <laughs> we just need, you know, six feet away. <laughs> That's right. That's right, man. No well, thanks. And Patrick, uh, you, uh, you've been a longtime supporter of IGFA, and we appreciate all you've done and, uh, and what you are continuing to do. So you, you take care, and uh, we'll be in touch, man. For sure. I'm always pleased to reach you and to reach all my uh, co-members at the IGFA. Thank you, guys, and thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye.